you to get your Bibles out. We're going to begin in John chapter 3. There's going to be a lot of verses, a lot of things on the screen to write down. So if you have a way of taking notes or maybe you want to take pictures of the screen, whatever is easiest for you, we're going to dive into God's Word today and uh, talk about love. Because everyone enjoys a good love story, right? I'm, maybe that's why Hallmark movies are so popular. I'm, I'm not sure, but... Uh, I, I have a picture of Leslie's socks on the screen um, that she wears this time of year. If you can read this, you're, I'm watching a Hallmark Christmas movie, so actually uh, I gave those to her a, a couple years ago, but uh, um, yeah, maybe that's why. We just, we love good love stories, because we all need love, or love is all we need. I'm not sure, ask the Beatles, but I do know um, that we love a good love story, and Christmas is a love story, but it's not like Hallmark. It's true love. It's God's love. It's the love that we've been craving for. It's God's love for us that came at Christmas. We're going to look at John 3.16 today, and and John 3.16, out of the 31,000 plus verses in the Bible, is by far the most popular verse, and probably just because it's such a succinct uh, capsulation of the gospel message. But I want to look at it today, and I want to kind of go by phrase by phrase through it, and I, I hope that you never look at this verse the same, that we take a deep dive into this very familiar verse and learn from it once again. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world. The first thing I want you to write down is that God's love is so big. For God so loved the world. The Greek word there for world is cosmos. So you probably already know a Greek word, right? Cosmos, the world, creation. God loves creation, everything he's created, every where he loves everyone, and it's hard to grasp this kind of love because God's love is so wide and so deep, and yet he loves his creation. He loves you. He loves me, and it's with great cost that he paid the price for that love, and nothing can separate us from that love. God's love is so big. One of my favorite um, quotes, it comes from Brendan Manning, it's this, God loves you unconditionally as you are, not as you should be, because nobody is as they should be. God loves you today. He loves right where you sit, right where you watch. God loves you unconditionally, for God so loved the world. So the question comes, and this is where it gets important, is how do you define love? Because we cannot allow the world to tell us how to define love. Because the world doesn't know. It can try to offer what it has, and even the greatest love in this world will leave you wanting. In fact, a lot of times the definition of love in the world is is just completely messed up because they have no idea what true love is. We throw the word love around all the time, right? We love Christmas, and we do. We love Christmas, but there's something deeper than just the sentimental feeling or this burst of passion or this this acceptance. You and I, we don't get to define love. Because here, write this down. We wouldn't have a clue what true love was if it wasn't for God. We just wouldn't have a, a clue what love is because that's, not who we are, right? That we, we, man, left to ourselves, we're a mess, right? So if it wasn't for God, we wouldn't know. Why? Because God is love, 1 John 4, 8. So God defines love. What is real love defined by God? Well, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, right? Beginning of verse 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, is not boastful, is not arrogant, is not rude, is not self-seeking, is not irritable, and does not keep record of wrongs. Love finds no joy in unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. 
love is so different coming from God, right? I mean, that love is selfless. That love is thinking of others more than ourselves. That love is giving. That love endures no matter what. And the ultimate definition of love actually comes from John 15, 13. This is Jesus on the very last night of his life around that table before he goes to the cross. He says this, greater love has none than this, that somebody lay down his life for his friends. That's the ultimate definition of love given by Jesus on the very last night of his life. That there's no greater love than that. He's given it in the context of talking about him being the good shepherd and we're his sheep. And we see that throughout John, especially in John 10. We see it in Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, 1, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want or I lack nothing. If you walk through that psalm, Psalm 23, just, man, I, I just get that out. That's God's love for you. Just highlight almost every verse in there. I care for you. I provide for you. He restores my soul. He, he guides me in his way. He's close to me. He watches out for me. He feeds me. He protects me. He heals me. He pursues me. God does it all, right? Because God loves you. For God so loved the world. And our response is in 1 John 4, 19, we love him because he first loved us. God wants to show you what true love is because every heart longs for love. But also in the context of this idea of being a shepherd, in John chapter 10, we have John 10, 10, where it talks about how the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy so there is an enemy that doesn't want you to know God's love. There's an enemy that wants to keep you from God's love. But God wants you to know and experience and live in his love, which leads to abundant life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Giving is a big part of Christmas. And when we got married, Leslie started a Christmas savings account. I wasn't ready for that, right? Because I just bought presents for people and went into debt and hope I paid it off the next year, right? Leslie had a plan. She had a list. She knew who we were buying for, what we were buying, what we were spending. She had a plan. And I said, thank you, Jesus, because uh, I needed her. I want to tell you today, God has a plan. He had a plan from the very beginning. This isn't just that he loves you. No, he had a plan to show you, because the Christmas story doesn't just happen one day in history. No, God had a plan from the very beginning. It started even in the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve fell. He said, I'm going to send a Savior. I have a plan to rescue my people. That's how much I love you. I love you so much that even when you walk away from me, I have a plan. And the whole Old Testament is God working out his plan to bring the Savior so that you and I can know love that we could have a relationship with God. God is active and he's giving. In Matthew 1.21, the angel announces the plan to Joseph. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. God had a plan. He, is, he, he gives to us that he gives to us his son. He doesn't just love us arbitrarily or with sentiment. No, he has a plan to show you his love. And that plan cost him everything. See, Jesus didn't come to earth to live an easy life. He came to die on a cross for our sins. That he came for you and me. He came to rescue us. It wasn't going to be easy. No, he had a plan to be our sacrifice. In Genesis 22, there is a story of Abraham. Abraham was the, the promised father of the Jewish people. And and Abraham didn't have a son, but God promised him a son, and that son of promise was Isaac that finally came at 100 years old. And, and then God says, I want you to sacrifice Isaac. I want you to sacrifice your son. I, I don't understand this story. It, it, it boggles my mind. I, I, I can't even imagine. I have three sons, but I still couldn't. It doesn't, it doesn't compute, and I, I know it doesn't compute with you because when our kids were up here, I wasn't watching them, I was watching you. You should have saw how many cameras across the same. It was just, it was, it was more fun seeing the joy on parents' faces as they were watching. You love your kids, right? 
I don't get this story. And yet Abraham is willing to obey God. And, and, but before he could sacrifice his son, God stops him. God stops him. And it's a picture that there is coming a day. Because Isaac is a type of Christ in the Bible. There is coming a day that the son of promise... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to sacrifice my son. Now, I'm going to stop you because you don't have to sacrifice your son, but I'm going to have to sacrifice mine. It's a picture of what is coming, that I will sacrifice my beloved son. God's love is so deep. It's so costly. It's so true. It knows no boundaries. He's willing to give up everything for you because he loves you. It says in Romans chapter 5 and verse 8, but God proves his love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us before we ever knew him. He says, I love you so much. I'm, I'm going to die for you before you ever know me. You might even hate me. Uh, you, you might not even care, but I'm still going to die for you because I love you that much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. God's love is a gift that must be received. See, loving relationships, I don't know how to explain this right, but loving relationships require um, two parties coming into agreement, right? A true loving relationship, it has to have two parties coming into agreement. There's nothing sadder than a marriage relationship where only one party is in agreement, right? It's sad when, when maybe a relationship with a child is just one-sided, right? The, it, true loving relationships are two-sided. They, they work in agreement with each other. And so God's love, it doesn't just happen to us. We must believe and receive from the Lord. And, and it begins with realizing, I need the love of God. I need what he did for me. I need that sacrifice of Jesus. I, I need what God did for me. It's our sin that separates us from God. It says in Isaiah chapter 53 and verse 6, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That I did my own thing. You did your own thing. We, we've gone our own way. We have messed up completely. And yet it's Jesus who loved us and took our iniquity upon himself. We didn't seek God out. He sought us out, right? He did it before we knew him. Before, you know, he did this. He just loved you. So he went to the cross even before you'd ever know him. He just did this for you because he loves you so much. And he still loves you today. I love Mr. Rogers. I grew up watching Mr. Rogers. Um, probably his most famous line is, I like you just the way you are. I like you just the way you are. And I love Mr. Rogers, and I think it's good to love people. But I think that line, I like you just the way you are, has messed up my generation and subsequent generations. Because um, I'm not a very good person. And I don't just need a tune-up or a tweak. I need to be born again. Like, I need a complete change. I need to become a new creation. Like, I don't just need a little bit. I need a lot. I get to teach at the college, and this semester I taught the life of Christ. And uh, so our uh, last week of class was last week. We have finals next week, uh, so pray for our students. But uh, we had our last class, and in the last class, we talked about the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And so um, we talked about the cross. We spent some time talking about the cross, and the cross is a symbol of our faith, right? Christianity, the cross is the symbol. You're probably wearing some form of jewelry right now that has a cross on it. That's, that represents who we are. But do we take time to think about the cross? And so every semester, I, I have a handout that I go over with my students, uh, and it's a, a medical description given by a, a, a doctor, a medical doctor of the crucifixion of Christ and what happens uh, physically to him. And I'm going to read that to you today. And, and as I'm reading that to you, it, listen to these words and just focus on the cross that's on the stage. I know it's a little dark back there, but just Focus on the cross that's on the stage, and, and I'm going to give a medical doctor's 
view of the physical description of the cross. The cross is placed on the ground, and the exhausted man is quickly thrown backwards with his shoulders against the wood. The legionnaire feels for the depression at the front of his wrist. He drives a heavy, square, wrought iron nail through the wrist deep into the wood. Quickly, he moves to the other side and repeats the action, being careful not to pull the arms too tightly, but to allow some flex and movement. The cross is then lifted into place. The left foot is pressed backwards against the right foot, and both feet extended, toes down, and nail is driven through the arch of each, leaving the knees flexed. The victim is now crucified. As he slowly sags down with more weight on the nails in his wrist, excruciating fiery pain shoots along the fingers and up the arms to explode in the brain. The nails in in the wrists are putting pressure on the median nerves. As he pushes himself upward to avoid the stretching torment, he places the full weight of, on the nail through his feet. Again, he feels searing agony as the nail tearing through the nerves between the bones of his feet. As the arms fatigue, cramps sweep through his muscles, knotting them in deep, relentless, throbbing pain. With these cramps come the inability to push himself upward to breathe. Air can be drawn into the lungs, but not exhaled. He fights to raise himself in order to get even one small breath. Finally, carbon dioxide builds up in the lungs and in the bloodstream, and the cramps partially subside. Spasmodically, he is able to push himself upward to exhale and bring in life-giving oxygen. Hours of limitless pain, cycles of twisting, joint-wrenching cramps, intermission, partial asphyxiation, searing pain as the tissue is torn from his lacerated back as he moves up and down against the rough timber. Then another agony begins. A deep crushing pain deep in, deep in the chest as the pericardium slowly fills with serum and begins to compress the heart. It's almost over now. The loss of fluid, uh, tissue fluids has reached a critical Level, the compressed heart is struggling to pump heavy, thick, sluggish blood into the tissues, and the tortured lungs are making, uh, are, are making frantic efforts to gasp in small gulps of air. He can feel, feel the chill of death creeping through his tissues. Finally, he can allow his body to die. All this the Bible records with the simple words, and they crucified him. He would rather die for you than to live without you. To go through that pain, to, to experience cruel and unusual punishment, he would rather die than to live without you. So if you're okay, and I'm okay on my own, why, why does he have to go to the cross? He has to go to the cross because I'm not okay, and you're not okay. He has to go to the cross because we need him, because left to myself, I am lost. I don't even want to think about my life without Jesus. I don't want to even think of who I'd be without him. See, I, I need him, you need him, and we need to come humbly just before a holy and righteous God submitted to him, he loves you. He's calling you to himself. And so accept the gift and don't perish. Receive that gift. Lose yourself in the amazing love of God. We do this when we believe. So again, what does it mean to believe? Because we see that word at Christmas a lot, right? Believe. But what does it mean to believe? Because we've all heard this verse, right? We all know the verse. So it's not about knowing. It's actually this. What does believe mean? It means to trust in, rely on, and cling to. That's what it means. To believe is to trust in, rely on, and cling to. So I, I do that with the cross. I trust in the cross. I rely on it, and I cling to it. I cling to his love. When I rely on God, I benefit from that love. I'm in that two-way relationship of love. God saves me from eternal destruction because he loves me. 
He didn't come just to, hey, you need to improve yourself. You need to get a little better. You know, I'm, I'm here to kind of tweak you, tune you up. No, you know what Jesus says? I've come to give you a new mind, a new heart, to make you a new creation. I came so that you might be born again. He says, come to me, look to me. I will save you. I will change you, and you will be brand new. Now, how long does this change last? And that's what I love about it. It's everlasting, right? It is for all of eternity. His, his love goes on and on and on. And that's great because, man, the love of this world, it comes and it goes, right? The love of people, it can fade. But the love of God never will. It will follow you all the way through eternity. That's the love of God. That's the relationship that we have. He will never stop loving his people to the furthest distant of eternity. And that's why we say this is good news of great joy to all people, right? Good news of great joy to all people. So two responses today. How do we respond to his love? How do we respond to the cross? One of two ways. Two, receive God's love and share God's love. You've got to receive God's love. You probably know this verse. You heard this verse. At least, if nothing else, you saw the sign at a football game, right? John 3, 16. But it's not just seeing it or knowing it. It's believing it. It's trusting in the love of God, the sacrifice of God for your sin. That's the bottom line. So I've got to receive God's love. It's got to be a two-way relationship. He doesn't, he doesn't put his love on us, force his love on us. It's like, just God, I realize I need you. And then I've got to share his love, right? This isn't just for me. For God so loved what? The world. Everyone. Everywhere. I don't get to hate anyone because God loves everyone. They may hate me. They may consider me in it, but I don't get to hate them. I have to love them because God loved me. I have to share God's love. It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 when he's talking about love, I just this is so important, so I want to make sure we get this. If I speak in uh, human or angelic tongues but do not have love, I'm a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have uh, all faith so that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. And if I give away all my possessions and I give over my body, uh, give my body over to boast, that's talking about being a martyr and do not have love, I gain nothing. It says, if you don't have love, you don't have anything. See, love is the highest standard of following Jesus. That I'm called to love even people that hate me. I love them because God loves them, right? And this, you can write this down. You can't, love, you can't love God unless you love your neighbor. You can't love God unless you love your neighbor. You, you have to love those around you. You have to share his love with everyone. See, what God did is, is he threw us a lifeline. He threw us that life jacket. He, he's coming by in that lifeboat. He said, come on, get in. I'm here. But it ha we have to receive that, right? And we're called to share that with other people. And so today I want those two things, receive it and share it. Those are the two things today. And so would you bow your heads and your hearts with me today as we pray? This gift from God, this love, this sacrifice, uh, this true love, the love that we've been looking for all our life has come our way. And I want us to receive that lifeline from God today. I love Christmas because it reminds me that God is with us, that he isn't far away, but that he came, that he's with us now and he's coming again. He's coming to judge the earth. He's coming. And I want to be ready. I want to receive the love of God. I want to believe in Jesus today. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this prayer, and I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me, because what you're doing is you're saying, look, I, I, I can't do this on my own. I need to be made new. I need to be born again. And this prayer of commitment is for everyone that's, that's here today. It's for everybody watching online or maybe listening later. I want to tell you this prayer right now. I want everyone to pray with me today. Would you repeat these words after me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. I want to turn from my sins. I now invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name.
Amen. Amen. Okay, write this date down right now. Write it in your Bible. Write it on your phone. Something like, today is the day I made that commitment. Today is the day that I believed in Jesus. Today is the day because the enemy is going to try to convince you that God doesn't love you, that nothing happened. Look, you were made brand new by the love of God today. So write it down. Hold on to it and uh, know that God loves you. Can I pray for you today? God, we just, we thank you so much for your love. Lord, we realize that um, we really don't know what love is without you. We might have pursued our whole life trying to find love. We might have listened to what the world says love is, but God, you're the only one that knows love. You are love. And thank you for loving us so much and, and having a plan and rescuing us. And Lord, we're thankful for the cross today. All that you've done for us today. God, thank you. Thank you for that love. Thank you for the rescue. Thank you for the lifeline, the life jacket, the lifeboat. God, thank you that you came by and rescued us. And Lord, I pray, especially this season, we would share your love with everyone that we meet. Lord, that we would share that lifeline, that rescue with everyone that we meet. Lord, put love in our hearts, your love into our hearts. And God, I pray that uh, this Christmas, many would come to believe in you, Jesus. And Lord, we believe that for the next couple of weeks, even here at church, that many would come to believe in you, to know you. We pray that for our children, that our children would believe in you and know you. We pray that for our families, God. We pray that for our friends. We pray that for this world. Oh, that we may know your love. God, thank you for your word today. May you just find some deep, good ground in our heart. And may it grow. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm grateful for the love of God. Um, I, I, it's funny because I, I read through that cross thing before. I've never gone through that without crying, so I made it today. That was awesome. That was really good. If you want a copy of that, I have some copies in the, in the lobby of, of what Jesus went through on the cross for you and me. There's also questions in the lobby if you want to just dive deeper into this message. Um, there's no right or wrong answer to these questions. They're just for you or your family or small group, um, just to, to, to kind of take a deeper dive into, um, into God's Word and, and to do that. So I encourage you to do that. Uh, the next two weekends are excellent weekends to invite people to church. Next weekend, we're going to talk about the peace of God and uh, what that means at Christmas, what it means to have peace with God. And so that's next weekend, and then the weekend after that's Christmas, and we have the choir and special music and just so many wonderful things over the next couple weeks. So we just encourage you to invite a family member, a friend to church. They're probably more likely to come to church uh, next couple weeks than ever before, so invite somebody uh, to come and, uh, and to meet Jesus. There's devotionals in the lobby as well on the table. Maybe you want to grab one or two extra to give uh, in a gift or in a card that you're giving someone uh, this year. Uh, those are there. They're available. They're free. And uh, make sure you stop by the table before you go. Um, we're going to receive uh, the blessing in just a moment, but, but one more thing, and uh, kind of important. Uh, we have missionaries all over the world, and I know we haven't talked a lot about them the last couple of years because of COVID and some being stuck overseas, some being stuck here, and we have ministries literally all over the world, almost on every continent that we support monthly um, and, and give thousands of dollars to. You'll see it in the, in the financial statement. So we, give, we just try to give as much as we can away. And um, we want to bless them at Christmas. So if you'd like to, to bless a missionary this Christmas, just give a little extra offering, just market missions, and we'll make sure that uh, our missionaries, wherever they're at, I know um, it, if, if we got a little extra money at Christmas, we'd be blessed. And so let's bless people that are serving the, God, the Lord, that gave up everything to follow him. Uh, let's give them a little something as well. Um, uh, Mark, one of our elders, is going to be down front to pray with anybody uh, that needs it. Let me tell you, I know there are so many people going through a hard time. Don't leave without getting prayer today. I want you to be prayed for because uh, you're not meant to go through this alone, right? You need, you need prayer. We need prayer. We need each other, right? Because, uh, man, God put us together, right? Put us together as a family. Nothing better. Let's receive the blessing of the Lord. Would you stand with me across the sanctuary?